Brothers, open up your Bible to the book of Ephesians today, and we're going to be talking about Ephesians, and then I'm going to be continuing this sermon series. It's called Stand On It. Today's part two, and we're going to, talk, we're going to be talking about a courageous stance, a courageous stance. Got a lot to say about that today. Whenever we open up our Bibles and whenever we look at the New Testament, of course, you have the four Gospels, and then you have the book of Acts, and then you have the letters, and then after the letters, then you have the book of Revelation. And those, those, different, those different categories are just wonderful. And you're like, okay, if I want to know all about King Jesus, then I'm going to look at the Gospels. But really, when I'm looking at the Gospels, I'm really, not only am I learning all about King Jesus and how he... How he moves in the midst of his humanity for humanity, even though he's 100% God. But he's also, of course, revealing to us the Father. And then when I look into the book of Acts, I can see the birth of the church, and I can see what the power of the Holy Spirit can do. So the, the book of Acts is about how the Holy Spirit interacts with the church, amen, and, and how we're supposed to deal with the world and how we're supposed to go into all the world. Then you get off into all the letters and all the epistles, and of course, Brother Paul, he's got a whole bunch of them, and then there's James, and then there's John, and then there's Peter, and there's Jude, and, and I, I love those things. Now, whenever I get into looking at the epistles of Paul, you're like, okay, well, what is an epistle? An epistle is a letter that you write to somebody with the understanding that other people are going to read it and use it as curriculum, right? So it's like, okay, if I write a letter to one of my beautiful grandchildren and I say, hey, now be sure and let all the other grandkids read this, I'm writing to the one person, to, to one of my seven grandkids, but I'm also writing it knowing that everybody else is going to be reading it, okay? So an epistle kind of works like that. And I, I don't know, but you can see so much of somebody's personality within an epistle. Leanna and I both woke up at 444 this morning, hallelujah, and we we're sitting out on the back porch, and I was drinking coffee, and the sun, the sun hadn't come up yet, and we were talking about um, the epistle of Ephesians, which we're about to look off into, and she said, you know, Troy, I can just see so much of the personalities of the writers within the epistles, and she was with me yesterday at the pastor's conference, and I was, I was speaking to our pastors here at Open Door about the epistles of Jesus that is in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, that you can see so much of the personality of Jesus in those epistles, and allow that man, he ain't playing, amen, he's serious, he is truly serious. Well, in some of the books, like, you know, I don't know, 2 Corinthians and Philemon and some in Colossians, you can actually see a whole lot of personal touches of Brother Paul. You can actually see it. Where it's like, hey, he's being very personal, and it's, it's more like, hey, this is what I think, and this is how I do things. But Ephesians is not like that. Ephesians... Um, is like this rock star book that he wrote to everybody about your Christian walk. No matter who you are, where you are, when you are, the book of Ephesians is about fundamental Christianity and what it means to live a Christian lifestyle. You and I should know the book of Ephesians. It should be one of our go-to books that we go to all the time. You know, it's not that big of a book, so it doesn't take that long to read all the way through the book of Ephesians. And I'd, like to, I'd love to challenge you today and say, today, beginning today, you're going to start going through the book of Ephesians and make sure that you know that. Well, it's interesting to me, too, that the condition that Paul wrote the book of Ephesians in is he was literally in Rome and he was chained to another soldier. And it's, this is one of the prison epistles, one of the, one of the letters that he wrote actually in chains while he was literally on a chain. And so when you get over into like Ephesians chapter 6 and you look over at that and he's talking about put on the full armor, number one, he got most of that from the book of Isaiah. He's referring to, he's referring to the book of Isaiah and we'll talk about that some other time. But make no mistake about it, he is chained to a Roman soldier. And he starts talking to us about putting on the full armor. Well, Ephesus is important. And Chuck Swindoll, who I love to study his books, he says Ephesians deals with topics at the very core of what it means to be a Christian. It's a very formal letter. It's like, okay, no, this is not just me being casual about stuff. You got to get this. You got to get this. You got you to get that. You got to get that. And you need to understand that. And so... 
The book of Ephesians is a jewel, and we should cherish it, and we should understand it, and we should think about it, and we should chew on it, because, because the Lord gave us something amazing in the book of Ephesians. Well, central to the very core of what it means to be a Christian is the call we find in the book of Ephesians, and we also find it all the way through the rest of the Word of God, is the call to outlast the enemy. Like, whoa, what are you talking about? I gotta, I gotta outlast the enemy. Yeah, you gotta outlive the attacks. You gotta outlast the enemy. You gotta outlast the trials that come after all of us. Because hard things come after every single one of us and we have to have a central core that says, one of my fundamental principles is this, you ain't running me off. I have a much, I have a much higher value for standing than I do in getting everything right. Religion is not like that. Religion says you gotta get everything right. And so they use that as an excuse to run off the battlefield because they don't know how to get everything right and that's what you gotta do whenever you're religious. I'm really not interested in getting everything right, to tell you the truth. Uh, whoa, stop. You don't wanna get everything right? Mm-mm, I don't. I wanna tell you, man, when I'm around, like I'll be around my grandkids this afternoon, I wanna tell you, we have no value for getting everything right. When they come outside and they, I've got coffee and they spill it, if my value is whatever you do, you better get this thing right, I can't have a relationship with my grandkids. Amen? Amen. It's like, no, that is not my highest value. You know what? We, we have mitigated the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ into areas of behavior. And it's ridiculous. And it's like, well, you know what? I saw that guy standing in that really hard place, but he didn't do a very good job. He did better than you. He didn't run off. Amen. You know, he didn't run off. He was there. You know, I, I've learned in doing lots and lots of uh, really cool interviews, I've learned that, hey, man, when you're talking to the media, you're not talking to your friend. And I, I, I think I'm everybody's friend, and I assume everybody is going to love me. I've only known a couple of people who didn't, and they were all stupid. <laughs> and so I just assume these are intelligent people, and they're going to love me. And I have learned, oh my gosh, they made me look bad. Like, well, did you say that? Well, yeah, but I didn't, it was, I was just being funny and I was just being friendly. I, I didn't mean for that to be formal. You know, I didn't, I, I wasn't, that wasn't what I thought we were doing. Oh, I've learned. I've learned. If you're talking to the press and if they're quoting you on something, man, you had, number one, if they act like they're not quoting you, they're lying. And you had better be very intentional about what you speak. And I want to tell you, that was, that, that's was that been a hard lesson for me. I, I got in trouble. The Denver Post did a big old article on me about 15 years ago, the first time I was in a big newspaper. And I was just so excited about it. I was like, woo, it'll be the big time. And nobody reads the newspaper anymore. It's like, woo, it's going to be amazing. And they were asking me the question about, there was a Pentecostal church in Houston, Texas, that the guy had one of the deacons in the church had snuck off from the church and actually played the lottery. And then he won the lottery and got millions and millions and millions of dollars, and then he went to tithe on his lotto check, and the church said, we refuse that money because it's wicked money. And so it made national news. They kicked this dude out of the church, and he was trying to give millions of dollars to his church, and they kicked him out because he was obviously a sinner. And so they were asking me about that. And listen, especially 15 years ago, see, I'm, I'm much more refined and cultured now. <laughs> but I was a little bit rough back then. And I was just too loose when I was talking to them because they asked me, they said, what would you do if somebody in your church won the lotto? I said, I would declare it Pastor Appreciation Week at Open Door Church. <laughs> I thought it was so funny and I thought of it so fast. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. And oh my God, the hate mail I got over that from, from otherwise godly people was so mad at me. I, they were so mad at me. And I was like, I was just being funny. I, well, I've learned. 
as you can see from my sermon so far. <laughs> well, central to the to the uh, to the key or the one of the central keys of our Christian walk is literally to be the guy that is in the difficult place and refuses to budge when everybody else leaves. And you cannot have a value for getting everything right if you're willing to do that. Now look, you want to do things right. And by the way, if you don't, uh, <laughs> if you don't get things right, I'll tell you, Jesus will be so happy to put you right back in that place again, over and over and over again until you get it right. But, but you're with Jesus every single time. It's, it's, it's a lot like, again, I told you, my grandkids are at the house today, and I want to tell you, I like to drink coffee in the afternoon, and when I sit out there, what's going to happen is when my grandkids come around out there, bye-bye, and they spill my coffee like they do every single time, I'm going to go, yay, and I'm going to hug them. Then I'm going to say, let's go make me another cup of coffee, and let's try and come out here and jump in my lap without scalding me nearly to death. <laughs> We're going to try that again. But I do not want my grandkids not to run up to me and hug me. Amen. Amen. So if they don't get it right, it's okay. We'll work on that later as they mature. Why are y'all laughing when I say mature? <laughs> so <laughs> we have to know how to stand. We have to. We got to know, no, I'm not giving that up. I'm just not going to. No, I'm not. Like, well, what are you going to do, Pastor Troy, when they tell you you have to have non-binary bathrooms in your church? That's a thing in states, and pastors are having to deal with that right now. What are you going to do about that? Mm, I don't know. I might put two toilets in the same room and just make it awkward for everybody. So I don't know. Maybe I'll put outhouses outside like old school John Johnson County. I don't know. But I want to tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to stand up and endorse that sexual madness. I'm not going to do that. So it's like, well, you got to know how to stand. And you, gotta, and you have to know that it's tough. And you also have to know that there is a reward on the other side of being an overcomer, of being the guy that stands, of being the faithful person that will not bell, even though it's extremely difficult. You, being that person. That there is actually a reward on the other side of that. And you have to hold on. And we think, well, God is just going to reward you. No, he's not. If you will not stand, no, he will not. It's like, what? Oh, no, I think God's going to reward me no matter what. No, he's not. James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. You don't get a participation award. That's a woke idea, and it is not in the kingdom. So, well, I said my prayers, don't I get a reward? No, not if you're not going to withstand, not if you're not going to overcome, not if you're not going to be, what if everybody else leaves and I'm the one that's standing there lonely? Uh, yeah, well, that's part of the walk. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, let us hold fast. And I love that term, hold fast. I just love that. That's old school language for man. You better dig in. Hold fast. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Like hang on to the faithfulness of God and believe in his promises. Don't waver. And what does it mean to waver? Man, I tried to ride a bicycle the other day for the first time in a long time and I saw some wavering going on. <laughs> I forgot how uncomfortable those seats were. <laughs> we need to move on. James chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brethren, whenever you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you might be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap, if what? If we don't give up. So it's like, oh, okay. And some of you guys are like, well, I've been believing God for 20 years and I hadn't seen it happen. That's amazing. Like, whoa, stop. 
You're impressed with that? Yeah, the Father is impressed with that. You need to read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 says, and these amazing men and women of God, they believed and 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 they suffered such hardship and they did not see the promise and the world is not worthy of them. Like, whoa, wait. What? Yeah, yeah. You know what? God thinks it is a bigger deal and you get a bigger reward if you believe God and you won't let go of it and you don't see it, but you never let go of it, than if you did get to see it. You get a bigger reward for that. He's like, that's incredible to me. That is remarkable. You're unshakable, lady. That's incredible. Wow. And all of heaven rejoices. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. So again, the promises of God are on the other side of endurance and overcoming and holding fast and being steadfast and saying, no, I'm not giving up on this. I'm not going to give up on it. In Jesus name, I will not give up on this the, until the Lord tells me to move. I will not be moved. Amen. I said, but everybody else wants you to move. No, just say no. Man, one of the reasons why I love serving King Jesus is because I'm anointed to be rebellious. <laughs> Don't you just love a good opportunity to just be rebellious against the world? Like, Mr. Brewer, would you please comply? No, 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 no. I don't think I will. And in fact, I think it's going to make you mad, and I think I'm going to enjoy that. Like, okay, you just like trouble. My name is Brewer. It means troublemaker. It means maker of beer, and then it also means troublemaker, like storms brewing on the horizon. I'm a brewer. I'm supposed to stir stuff up. That's what I'm supposed to do. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Man, I want to tell you, this stuff is not taught anymore. What is taught is that we get some kind of a, a kingdom version of a participation award, and it's baloney. Man, you better get in a fight. Get in the fight and hold on. Some of you guys have been holding on for your kids. You've been holding on for your husband. You've been holding on. You've been holding on. You are not foolish for doing that. You're holy. You're sanctified. Don't give up. Well, everybody just points out, you know, man, we had never seen it happen. I guess I was stupid for doing that. No, they were stupid for not jumping in. I want to encourage you in the name of King Jesus. You know, listen, guys, Jesus is coming back soon. And one of the big things that people scoff at that, and the Bible says that they would, is they would say, where's the promise of his coming? You guys have been saying now for 2,000 years he's going to show up. He hasn't showed up yet. He hasn't showed up yet. He hasn't showed up yet. Well, that just proves I'm saved, that I believe in it. I'm standing in the midst of 2,000 years of history that we call the last days. And like, well, isn't that a long time? Well, relatively speaking, it's a long time for me. But I can tell you this, the promise, the, the promise of the Messiah in his first coming was 4,000 years. And we're only halfway there for his second coming. If those people could hold out for the first coming, I guarantee you, I can hold out. With this history that I have with King Jesus, with the signs and the miracles and wonders that I've seen, with the day that God Almighty allowed me to be born in, with all this good stuff, no, I don't think I'll be giving up the rapture of the church anytime soon. I don't think I will. I think I'll hold on to it. <laughs> so in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul begins to tell us that if you're going to stand, we have to possess what he calls the whole armor of God. And here's what I want to tell you is this. If you could stand without the armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6 would not be here. You can't stand because of your theology. You can't stand because of your strong church community. Like, I think I can. Well, yeah, you could before COVID, and then 32% of all churches in America, in America left. 32%. One third fell. You guys know that? 
Biggest crisis the American church has ever seen, and everybody yawns. 32% of all pastors in the United States were no longer pastors after COVID. 32%. And nobody talks about it. I said, well, I, I, think that, I think that, you know what, the people that I'm around, that'll get me, I'll be able to stand. It'll help you temporarily until a crisis happened, and then they all run off. You're going to have to stand. And if you're going to stand, you have to have the armor of the Lord. You have to have it. You do not get away from this. You're not going to get around it. You have to have this. So let's look at it. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. So Paul says in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I, I, would, I need to just do a whole sermon just on that one part of that because anytime that you're talking about be strong in the Lord and, and in the power of his might, meaning it means you learn to host his presence. You learn to live in his manifest presence because you're in him and he's in you. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 11, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. So it has to do with, are you somebody who knows how to get up in the morning and know the presence of the Lord? Are you somebody that knows how to know, like, okay, there you are, King Jesus, I found you, sir. There you are, I know your presence. Are you somebody that knows the presence of the Lord? Because in his manifest presence is the power of his might. Verse, we're still in verse 11. Ooh, I'm preaching good today. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's that first word, stand. So again, if you could stand without the whole armor of God, if you could, it would not say, put on the whole armor of God so that you can. So you have to have it. This is it's a really big deal. It says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Meaning two different, two different ways that you can look at this is this. You do everything that you can do until you can't do anything else and then you can still stand. Another thing, another way that you could put this sentence is this, and after it's all over with, you should still be standing. Having done all that you can do, you still should be standing when it's all over with. Like that's a determination that you make as soon as you enter into a fight. I remember when I was a kid, we used to go to Brazos River and go fishing a whole lot, and me and my knucklehead friends, um, you know, we'd go down there and, and uh, you know, be super young and drive down there and it's back in the day when you could do those kinds of things and we lived we were all a bunch of country bumpkins and I mean if you were 13 or 14 years old you probably had an old truck and we'd hop in that old truck and we'd uh, drive down there and we'd go fishing out there and one of the things that we did because we were silly kids is we'd swim the river and I can remember one time being 13 or 14 years old and not paying attention knowing that the river was up and looking at it and we were all just standing there looking at it. We're looking at the other side, and we all wanted to go fishing on the other side. And we were looking at it, and we're looking at how wide the river was and how fast it was moving. And I was like, we can do it. <laughs> like, yeah, we can do it. And so take our, our fishing rods and literally put it through the loops of our shorts. You know, we were wearing cut-off blue jeans. Put it, put it through the loops, tie it off, and say, are you ready? And then I can remember saying, once we go in that water, we can't stop. Don't stop. And they're like, okay, like, you ready? Like, yep, boom, jump off the cliff into the water. And it's like, as soon as you enter into it, like, I've got to get to the other side and I cannot stop until I get to the other side. And it's like, that kind of stupidity, it's a miracle we didn't get, we didn't drown. It's just a miracle. And I thank God. Uh, there's been a lot smarter kids than us who have drowned. And I praise God that that didn't happen. But I can remember, I can remember the determination was not, should we get in the water? That was a done deal. We we're going to get in the water. Right or wrong, we we're going to get in the water. The determination is this. Am I sure I can, I, I, am I positive that I, I can get to a place where I will not give up because that's going to be really hard? 
and going, yeah, I ain't give it up, let's go. And then boom, off we went. And then of course we had to swim back. And again, it's just a miracle. I just, oh my God, we needed adult supervision. <laughs> and so that's how you have to look at a lot of the battlefields. Is not, the, the issue is not, should you stand? The issue is this, are you gonna determine that you will not give up as soon as you step foot into it? Like, okay, I'm not, I'm here now. This is me. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put upon the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I wanna just kinda of unpack this for you guys here just over the next few minutes, and I wanna walk you through this. So let's talk about these seven different pieces of armor. It's very interesting to me because Goliath has six pieces of armor, and there's, there's two demonic forms of armor that was given to King David. One is he was presented with the armor of Goliath of Gath, and secondly, he was presented with the armor of Herod and told to wear it, and he rejected both of them. It's a really big deal to reject the wrong armor and to be determined to put on the right armor. King David had that down. So it starts off here, out of all the things to get dressed first, it tells you to put on your belt first. Well, that sounds like one of my grandkids right there. Like, you don't put on your belt first. I mean, who puts on their belt first? Like, I can't even see my belt when I wear it, like somewhere down there. So it's like, how does that work? Why would you put on your belt first? Well, the belt of truth is a lot like Batman's utility belt. Everything connects to it, everything does. It holds everything in place. So the belt of truth is this. I am gonna fight for what's real. And this is real. This fight that I'm in is real. The word of God is real. The, promise, the promises that he has given me is real. This is the reality of it. Devil, you will not control the narrative of this thing. I know the truth. If you, if you don't have the belt of truth, the rest of it will not stay on you at all. We have to have a tremendous value for truth. The Bible says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Those two things, walking in mercy and walking in truth at the same exact time. Um, the devil's weapons, his lies, his falsehood, his misinformation, his disinformation, his miscommunication, the chaos that the enemy brings to you, you have to be determined, no, 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 no. I am clothed in the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the way, the truth, and the life. And what he says goes, amen. God's weapons that he gives us for the belt of truth have to do with integrity and honesty. And we humbly take the high ground because, because Jesus is victorious. And you know what? I know it's real. I'm going to outlast the devil. And this is something else. Even if I die, like, oh my God, you don't ever think about dying, do you? Yeah, sure. Of course I do. I'm a dude. I'm a dude. I'm, I'm 57 years old and I'm a dude. And I think about that. And I think, okay, well, why, why do you think about dying all this? Because I want to finish well is why. I want to finish well. I'm determined I'm going to finish well. And so even if I die before I think I'm going to die, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ assures that the worst thing is never the last thing. Amen? So like, and, and by the way, you don't need to be scared of your death day. Just invite the Lord into it right now because he's not subject to time. Don't wait until you're trying to breathe to try and pray a very eloquent prayer. Pray right now. Lord Jesus, you know the day I'm going to take my last breath and I pray God for the final five minutes of my life. Show up. God, I want to, I want to worship you. I want to finish well. And you know what? He's not subject to time. He'll enter into that timeline right this second. He'll be waiting for you there. Amen. Like, that brother's crazy. <laughs> you have no idea. The next one after that is the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? It's the battle for your heart. Who does your heart belong to? The first one is truth. The second one is righteousness. And man, I love that. I can't tell you how much I love that. So who owns the throne of your heart? 
Who owns the throne of your heart? Amen. And like, you know what? King Jesus owns the throne of my heart. I got a lot of things to say about that, but I'm going to keep on going. There's something else too. However my heart is broken, and nobody in this room gets, gets to go through life without having their heart broken. Nobody does. And if you're like, I have my heart broken, I'll never get over it. Well, that's on you. Because the person sitting next to you has also had their heart broken, and the person sitting next to them has also had their heart broken. And some people in this room are victorious, and some people are not. It might just, you might just be in a season where your heart is so broken, you don't know how to have victory except for to stand. Amen. Like, I don't, I don't know how to think about this. I don't know about that. I don't know about this. I just know this. I ain't, I ain't budging. I'm still a Jesus person. Amen. Friends, I want to just tell you, man, you can do this. And let me tell you how you do this. You say, you know what? My heart belongs to King Jesus. It belongs to the Lord. It's the core of all that I am. It belongs to him. The next one is shoes for the gospel of peace. You always wear cowboy boots. Today I'm wearing my hey dudes. Amen. Because I was at the beach in the first part of this week. And part of me doesn't want to leave. Amen. Actually, because my boots are all real muddy right now. And I was like, eh, take too long to clean them this morning. So it was like, what does that mean? You know, the, the, you got shoes that are like peace. It's like, yeah, okay, this thing's taking a hit. 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 But I'll tell you what, my feet are standing in a place of peace with King Jesus. Do you know how to be led by your peace? Amen. And so you need to be able to discern the difference between, I don't have peace about this situation, but I, got, but I got peace about how Jesus is with me in this situation. Those are two different things. I'm in situations all the time that I have no peace about whatsoever. Like, you know, I have never one time ever got up here to preach that I wasn't nervous. Not, not one time. And I know I come across as the most confident dude in the whole world. And I'm just telling you, I'm not. It's just how I come across. I just, I come across like that. And I'm glad I do. I really, I really do. But you can, you know, you can ask anybody that knows me. Man, when I'm, when I'm not up here on the stage, um, if we're talking about, hey, Troy, you're, you're going to go on TV or you're going to go on radio or you're going to go behind the pulpit, I'm like, I'm serious about it. I got to get my act together. I don't just get up here and just spontaneously do things. This is, you know, tens and tens of hours of study this week. And I typically put together four or five or six or seven sermons and know that I'm only going to get to one piece of it, of, of, of one of those things. Like, well, why do you so over-prepare? Because that's my walk with King Jesus, and that's my privilege. Amen. And I want to do that. But make no mistake about it. My confidence, when I'm standing up here in front of y'all, my confidence is just how I stand in Jesus. It's not that I know how to get through any kind of territory whatsoever. It's just I know that Jesus will be with me in that. And in that, I do have great confidence. Um, the next one is the shield of faith. Amen. The shield of faith. Um, when we're talking about the shield of faith, <clears throat> I want to just tell you, our faith will keep us from being exposed to a lot of things that we would otherwise be exposed to, even in the midst of, of a terrible area. Just a lot of times, a lot of the dents and dings that we get in life is simply we just don't know how to have faith through the difficult things we're going through. It's like, okay... Uh, what's real is if I've got a big old shield of faith, if I actually have that, I'm like, okay, I don't know exactly this or that, and I'm not sure about this, and I'm not sure about that, but I know this. My God is with me. My God is with me. And a lot of people go through a lot of unnecessary hurts in life simply because they do not know how to yield the shield of faith. There's some things that just should not be an option for you to disbelieve. Uh, Any time in your life that you're doubting if God is good, you're under the influence of a lie. And you, you need to learn that very early in your Christian walk. No, God's good. Go, no, 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 no. God's good. God is good. I promise you, he is good. I promise you. And if you come across something, you come across some terrible situation where people are being enslaved and all kinds of horror and all kinds of mess, you know, the devil will come to you and say, see, God's good sometimes. They're like, no, devil. Listen, you're not going to ding me with that. We've already settled that matter. God is good. And Jesus is going to come back. And the next time he comes back, he's going to be dressed in his full armor. And he's going to get in your face. And he's going to deal with this mess. The justice of the Lord will prevail because of his goodness. It's an evil and wicked district attorney that will not prosecute people. 
I want to say it again. It is a wicked and evil district attorney that will not prosecute people. I want to tell you, God ain't like that. God Almighty will show up and he'll deal with everything that has ever separated you from him. He will deal with every single monster from the pit of hell that has ever, ever, ever afflicted you in any way whatsoever. Justice is coming and his name is Jesus. <laughs> then there's the helmet of salvation. And you fight from a place of being saved. You do not fight for a place to be saved. Amen. Next one is the sword of the spirit. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says the word of God is living and active. It's quick. You know those scriptures, right? Sharper than any two-edged sword. Dividing asunder. Piercing, right? Divides the difference between your soul and your spirit and your joints and your marrow. That's a whole huge understanding that goes with that. But the bottom line is that the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the Spirit-activated Word of God within your life is not, a def is not a defensive weapon. It is an offensive weapon. Oh, I can't tell you how much I love that. Well, it's time for me to close, and here's what I'd close on. <clears throat> when I first started studying this a long time ago and looking at it, one of the things that I, I, I like to always do is compare the armor of God to what the high priest wears. Okay, because as a priest, I put on the armor of God. But also, of course, to, to put on the armor of God as to what a Roman soldier would wear because Paul was literally chained to one whenever he wrote this. When I look at it and I go, wow, man, you got this belt of truth. And that's cool. The breastplate of righteousness. Okay. Okay, your feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So you know how to be led by your peace. A lot of times you're, you're not led by your understanding. You're led by the peace. Like, I don't get this, but I've got peace right here. Jesus is here. This is where I'll stand. Amen. You got helmet of salvation. You got a sword of the spirit. You have these things. Man, you're covered. And remember, you cannot stand. You will not outlast your issue unless, unless you have these things. Out of all the places that you're covered, there's one place that you're not. And since I've already messed up this sermon and can't put it on TV, I'm going to tell you, there is no butt armor. <laughs> the reason why so many people do not make it is because they turn and run. And they're not covered. It is an amazing thing to me that God Almighty would send you out on a battlefield with your honey showing. <laughs> and I want you to think about the mentality of God to say, I'm sending you onto a battlefield and oh, we're just going to leave that back door down. <laughs> like, why would you do that? Because nobody's ever going to see it. I trust you. I really do. I really do. I trust you. Nobody's ever going to see that. Right? All right. Yeah, because if you do, if they do, my goodness, what a target they're going to have. <laughs> because you have quite the wide load. I want to just... In a, in a funny kind of way, I want to just tell you that that is really profound to me. It really and truly is. It's like the reason why the Lord didn't cover my backside is because he's trusting me that the enemy will never see it. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. Awesome. Well, friends, y'all go ahead and stand up. Man, I love the word of God. Thank you all for putting up with me this morning. I, I didn't do very well this morning. <laughs> well, thank you. I know, I, know Leanna's, I know Leanna's watching right now. And she, she's like, that happens every time I'm not sitting on the front row. You start acting bad. <laughs> Guys, let's all come before King Jesus. King Jesus, sir, we wouldn't be clothed in Christ. 
We want to be clothed in the Messiah. God, we want to be, God, we want to have a garment of praise, and God, we want to armor up and have all the armor of the Lord upon us. King Jesus, forgive us, God, for the battlefields that we have left because we were ashamed of how messy we looked in that battlefield. And God, we were scared. And I pray, Father God, sir, that you would indeed forgive us, help us. Father, I speak renewal in this house in the name of King Jesus and declare the armor of the Most High God. I declare in the name of King Jesus every place where there has been a defeat and there's big gashes in those armor. I just, I just declare in the name of King Jesus that those are beautiful battle scars to you, Lord God. Beautiful battle scars to you. And I rebuke shame in the name of King Jesus. And Father God, sir, I pray, Lord God Almighty, and God, we recommission right here and we say, Father God, sir, we just, we just want to declare our allegiance to you. God, we want to declare our allegiance to you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We pray, Father God, sir, for the belt of truth in a whole new way. And I just declare it over everybody here in the name of King Jesus. I declare a supernatural ability for the breastplate of righteousness. I declare a supernatural God-given gift to have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I declare in the name of King Jesus that you indeed do have the helmet of salvation and nothing is able to get to your head that is not King Jesus. I declare in the name of of King Jesus, amen, that the sword of the Holy Ghost, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, belongs to you. I declare it. The shield of faith that you have is new and renewed in your life in Jesus' name. I declare revival in your house, in your mind, that you, you're not gonna panic because, because you look through that black screen and see what's happening to our planet. And you say, no, 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 listen, the sky is not falling, the kingdom is coming. In the name of King Jesus, the kingdom is coming. And God can count on me for this day.